Okay, hello everyone. Can you hear me? Can you give me a brief confirmation in the chat channel? Okay, very good, thank you. So welcome back to lecture two of this lecture series on foundations of quantum mechanics. Um, I want to start by having some organizational announcement, uh, which is only for the students in Erlangen. We will have a written exam because I think there are about 30 or so of you registered. And this exam tentatively will be on February 17 in the morning. If that turns out to be a problem for someone, then we would have to discuss it and we could use the discussion group for that purpose. Otherwise, you can already start registering for the exam in the Mind Campus group. Okay, so this is what I wanted to say there. And now we can really start with today's lecture. And I want to start with a little bit of recap. We are currently still in the introduction where I try to review the Schrödinger equation, or the basics of quantum mechanics as you would find it in the first year lecture course. And last time we came as far as discussing the probability interpretation on a very uh, low level. So we would uh, have Max Born declare that um, if you look at psi squared, uh, this has to be interpreted as the probability density of finding uh, the particle somewhere in space. And so this gives an interpretation uh, to the result of, say, applying the Schrödinger equation to the hydrogen atom, where you would have kind of smeared out density psi squared. And the meaning of that is not that you have a smeared out charge density, as Schrödinger had initially attempted to explain it. But instead, this means that you have a variety of different situations. So in a measurement, you might find the electron in the upper left corner, or in another measurement of the electron's position, you might find it at a different spot, or you might find it at a third spot. So it's this set of possibilities that is encoded in this probability density. But in each of those cases, the electron is a point particle, and it is uh, localized at some spot, and all the charge is concentrated at this spot. So that's uh, the probability interpretation, which is simple enough on this level, and it solves a lot of problems. We discussed last time when you have a scattering situation, you might have a wave coming in, and maybe this is still microscopically extended, maybe on the scale of micrometers. But that once it is scattered from an obstacle, um, typically the waves will diverge in all possible directions, and then and you could have an extension even on the macroscopic scale. And then the question would be, if that were really a charge density extended over these distances, we would directly run into contradiction with experiment. So the probability interpretation solves all of these problems. OK. So now um, the question, several questions now come up. One of the first questions is, well, Let's assume I perform a measurement, a measurement of position. And then what should I do with my wave function? What happens to the wave function? I cannot just apply the Schrödinger equation, the continuous time evolution. What should I do with my wave function after I have detected the electron at some particular position? And that leads us to what is commonly known as the collapse of the wave function. This is, of course, a fancy word. Um, but basically, it just means that if before the measurement you had a very extended wave function, but then you detect the electron at a particular position, what you should do is you should 
localize the wave function at this particular position. That is the measured position that you observed in your measurement. And because a localized highly concentrated wave function has a lot of momentum components at arbitrary momenta, it will quickly then spread out from this particular position into all directions and re-emerge from there. And it is this step that we would call the collapse of the wave function. Now, this makes a lot of sense if you think about it in terms of the probability interpretation, because um, if initially you had a completely delocalized probability density that was uh, extended over all of space or a large part of space, then in a probability interpretation, this does not mean that the electron itself as a particle is smeared out, but it could be either here or there. And once you measure it, you know where it is. And so your wave function, which represents also your knowledge about the position of the particle, should then get localized to the spot that you have actually detected. That makes a lot of sense. This, by the way, would even be true in a classical a description of probabilities and the information you gain from observing a particular outcome in such a random stochastic experiment. So in classical stochastics, uh, you would also understand probabilities as a representation of your uncertainty. And once you gain some certainty by observing some specific value, then of course you should update your probabilities. And there's a whole set of theory connected to that. Uh, there is the Bayes formula of probability, uh, probability theory. And we will later, when we discuss measurements in more detail, learn about how this is connected to what happens with wave functions. But for now, uh, let's just uh, accept here the collapse of the wave function as a kind of practical minded approach to say what happens when you do a measurement. Now, this is a particular example when you have a position measurement. The question is what happens when you measure other operators, when you measure the momentum, when you measure a spin component and so on. And so just very briefly, formally, we then follow the theory that was first developed by von Neumann. So the idea is first to recognize that um, when you measure something, you always measure an operator and it's a Hermitian operator, which has real eigenvalues. So it can represent physical measurement results. So uh, you have an Hermitian operator, some observable A, like the position or the momentum or the spin. And this operator of course has eigenvectors, let's call them phi n. They come with eigenvalues, let's call them a n. And then when you perform a measurement in the simplest description of a measurement, a strong projective measurement as we would call it now, uh, you obtain one of these eigenvalues. So one of the different values of the position or one of the different values of the momentum or spin equals plus one half or minus one half in a certain direction. And uh, you would uh, obtain the particular value, for example, a n with a certain probability. And what is this uh, probability? Well, you would just decompose your original state psi in terms of these eigenvectors, which form a complete basis. Um, and the amplitude associated to each of these eigenvectors is of course this overlap, phi n times psi. And when you take the square of this, you get the probability to observe this particular eigenstate of the observable A during the measurement. And then this is the probability, but what you should do in the spirit of the collapse rule is that after the measurement, you simply 
replace the original state psi, which was still a superposition of many of these eigenvectors by a new state which is simply this eigenvector. So that's the collapse prescription on the level of arbitrary observables. And technically this describes really most measurements, maybe with the exception of measurements where you do not learn complete information. So there's a remaining uncertainty, which eigenvalue did you actually measure these weak measurements we will discuss later, but technically this is the basis for basically all of the theory of measurements. Now, there are, however, disadvantages. There are obvious disadvantages. The first one is that it's kind of ad hoc. You are outside the continuous time evolution of the Schrodinger equation. So let's make a little list of problems that we see here. And then of course, these problems we try to address in the rest of the lecture series. So the first problem that this is an ad hoc prescription. It works in practice. One never sees any contradiction to experiment, but it's ad hoc because it's outside the unitary time evolution of the Schrodinger equation. It's a sudden, drastic, and disruptive process that takes place when the measurement is done. Okay. And in some sense, it's also an artificial distinction between the quantum system itself, like the single electron that we're talking about with its wave function, and any outside apparatus, measurement apparatus that you're using to perform the measurement. You do not describe them on the same footing. Quantum system and the measurement apparatus are separate in this most naive uh, of um, theories of quantum measurement. So there's a certain artificial distinction between the quantum system and whatever else is needed physically to carry out the measurement. And so the natural questions that are suggested by these, uh, by these problems are, can we perhaps describe a measurement completely within uh, the Schrödinger equation? And as we will see in a later chapter, this is actually possible, let's say up to some level. And that also resolves at least to a certain extent, this artificial distinction between the quantum system and the measurement apparatus, because you can indeed also apply the Schrodinger equation to understand how the measurement apparatus works and how the measurement in detail uh, evolves in time. And then in a slightly smaller item, uh, as I already mentioned, instead of these strong projective measurements where you have a definite outcome, you can also have weak measurements where you only gain some partial information, and then maybe you don't get this drastic collapse of the wave function. And actually when you describe real experiments that do measurements, this is an important this is an important scenario. So uh, to be more realistic, this uh, should be done. So weak measurements uh, can also be described in a more complete uh, theory of measurements. So this is something that we will be going to discuss in the lecture series later. Now so much for the collapse of the wave function, but there is still an open question if you are really interested in the foundations of um, quantum mechanics, you could ask, well, it's all fine to learn that there is this probability description and that the electron is not smeared out, but I can find it either here or there or there. But what about the dynamics? What happens 
in between the measurements, what happens at the level of single particles? This is a question you might want to answer. Why are things stochastic? And you may already anticipate that quantum mechanics being as mysterious as it is, to answer this question is really, really tricky. But to ask it is relatively straightforward. So let us discuss an example, a very simple example that already is around since the uh, beginning of quantum mechanics, you have some emission event. So for example, you have an atom that decays and it will emit a photon or it will emit an electron because maybe there's a decay in the atomic nucleus. In any case, there is a decay event. And as a consequence, there will be an outgoing wave emitted from this atom propagating into all directions. So emission of an electron or a photon doesn't really matter. Um, and when we then perform a measurement, of course, as we just said, we will get a definite outcome. So for example, here it is that the electron strikes some detector and we get a click. Question is, can we interpret that in a more reasonable way instead of just closing our eyes and saying, well, at first there's this wave function evolution, don't ask about the details, and then suddenly there is an individual particle detected at some point. Now for this particular physical scenario, there is a very simple possible interpretation, which you would come up with if you think about it for just a short time. And this interpretation sounds very classical. This interpretation would be that either I have an electron or photon flying out in this direction, or I have it flying out in another direction, or in yet another direction, and so on. So you could say you did not observe the details of this emission event and you did not track the trajectory of this particle. But if you had done so, you would have observed uh, what I just uh, have drawn here. And if that is the case, of course, if there is a particle emitted in a random direction, then it's also very natural that if you finally detect it, in one run of the experiment, you will detect it in one corner and another run and another corner and so on. So you would simply have random classical trajectories. And that would explain the stochasticity in the final detection. It's certainly okay for this case. It properly describes the statistics in this case. And it is actually what Einstein, for example, was thinking about photons back in around 1905. So once you say I have wave packets and they are concentrated lumps of energy, then it's natural to ask, okay, now what should I think of a situation where a wave is emitted in all direction, but still when I finally detect the photon, I observe it as a localized event. And this would be the natural explanation that you could give. The problem is, this very naive idea is a little bit too naive because it actually does not work whenever interference plays an important role. And so we have to discuss this. And the best or simplest example for interference is of course the double slit setup. So uh, I have 
double slit and I will have a wave coming in, something like a plane wave. And you know that after the slits, it will look more like spherical waves and the spherical waves from the two slits will superimpose. And because of that, there will be interference. So if you have finally a screen where the particle is detected, then you find in the wave function and therefore also in psi squared, this characteristic interference pattern. Now, in the spirit of what we just said, let's try to interpret this in terms of trajectories. So we will now go and make a certain assumption that all of this could be explained in a very simplistic manner using trajectories. And then we will see that this assumption fails. And this is probably something you already discussed in your basic quantum physics lectures. I just want to repeat it and be very precise this time. So let's write down the assumptions we have. First, um, each electron going through this apparatus has a definite trajectory. We don't observe it, but behind the scenes, such a trajectory exists. And then to keep it simple, we will assume that each electron trajectory only goes through one and only one slit. So what that means is um, certain funny trajectories are not allowed. For example, I go first through the upper slit, then I loop around and then go through the lower slit and finally through the upper slit and then I proceed. This would not uh, um, be allowed. And then third, we want to assume there are no long range interactions. So what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that an electron cannot feel the other slit if it's going say through the upper slit. There is no magic force that lets it basically detect the presence of the other slit. So again, this would not be allowed. And then finally, to make all the assumptions really explicit, um, we also assume, typically this experiment is done, of course, with thousands and millions of electrons, one sent after the other through the experimental setup, because in the end, you want to observe the full probability density. So you need to collect statistics. But we want to assume that you make sure the stream of electrons is sufficiently rare, so the electrons come at large time intervals, that they have no chance of uh, interacting with each other. because that would also make things much more complicated. So again, uh, each electron has a definite trajectory in the spirit of what we just discussed, because we found this a nice hypothesis to explain the stochasticity and the quantum mechanical outcomes. But each of these trajectories only goes through one slit. There's no long range interaction, so you cannot find out about the other slit um, through these long range interactions. And in addition, uh, electrons come at very rare time intervals, so they do not interact with each other. If all of this is true, if all of this is true, then we can immediately draw a few very simple consequences. And so let's list these consequences. The first thing is that if we look at the pattern on the screen, it's of course made up of many electrons that hit on the screen. 
And since each of these electrons had a definite trajectory and the trajectory went through one and only one of the slits, we could distinguish those that were produced by one, um, by one of the slits and those that were produced by electrons going through the other slit. So each electron has gone through either the upper or the lower slit. So the pattern on the screen comes from a certain distribution of these two possibilities. For example, just to make it concrete, but that's not so important for the argument, 50% from the upper slit. So electrons having gone through the upper slit. and 50% from the lower slit. This is just an example of the two slits are equally large and um, the statistics is even, okay. So that's the first con simple consequence. We can group these two types of trajectories. And then we can also say that if we wanted to have the pattern only made up by the electrons going through the upper slit, there's a very simple way to do this. We simply close the lower slit. So that is an experiment that uh, could be done. And likewise, uh, the other way around. Now, what happens if you actually do this? Well, you probably have learned this in your lectures. What happens if you do this and you say block off the lower slit is that on the screen, you see a pattern that looks very different. It's just a smooth distribution uh, without any interference. Strictly speaking, there's a, a small footnote. You can get interference patterns by diffraction even at a single slit, but this is separate from what we observe in the overall interference pattern. So, um, and if you were to close the upper slit, sorry, yeah, if you were to close the upper slit, then you would uh, observe a pattern that is slightly more centered towards the lower slit, but is also rather smooth. And now this directly contradicts the experiment because the overall pattern had this characteristic interference fringes. So it is never just the sum of these two patterns as it should be according to the conclusions we just drew from our simple model. So uh, sum of these is not equal to the actual observed experimental interference pattern. In other words, there's a direct contradiction between our simplistic assumptions that we spelled out very explicitly and the experiment. So uh, just to sum it up uh, in the real experiment, you don't get interference uh, if one of the slits is closed. but you do get interference uh, when you open both slits. And so that's a contradiction with our little simplified model. So something must be wrong about our assumptions. And that's why I took great care to spell out all of these assumptions, namely that there are definite trajectories. Each trajectory only goes through one slit. There's no long range interactions and the electrons do not interact with each other. If you were to allow for say long range interactions, then maybe an electron 
going through the upper slit could feel the lower slit being open or closed and could adapt its behavior correspondingly. And then all bets are off, then anything can happen. So then you don't get a contradiction to the experiment anymore. But all four of these assumptions together are in contradiction with the experiment. I just want to spell out once more, if we compare against the quantum mechanical prediction, what we would have found here. And then I'll try to answer the questions. Let me see these questions. There is a contra So the first question is here, there is a contradiction, even if the experiment were done only with one slit. Um, well, then I, I mean, the contradiction comes about by comparing several experiments. There's the experiments with either the upper or the lower slit um, being open only, and the experiment with both slits being open that shows the interference pattern, which happens to be not the sum of these individual uh, patterns. So that's the contradiction. So I really need to compare these different experiments. Okay. So let me just make it clear in a slightly different way. Um, when I calculate the actual result from the quantum mechanical calculation, I can also distinguish into contributions from the upper and the lower slit, let me call them U and L. But in this case, it will be contributions to the wave function. So that's the part of the wave function that went through the upper slit. I can draw it. This is this part, the spherical wave that went through the upper slit. And then Psi L is the spherical wave that went through the lower slit. And that's the total wave function that will hit the screen. And in order to get the probability density, of course, I have to square it. Now the square of the sum will be the square of the part that went through the upper slit, the lower part, and then there will be cross terms. And that's uh, the really exciting part. It's these cross terms that do depend on the relative phase between the two spherical waves and that really form the interference fringes. So these are the interference terms. And so the problem we now see is that our naive assumptions would have yielded only the first part. without the interference. Okay. So now you could go back and say, well, it is indeed a little bit drastic, isn't it? If we have experiments where both slits are open or only one of the slits is open. So we are comparing very, very different situations and indeed if i have for example these long range interactions or i have these trajectories that really loop around and go through both slits somehow one after the other then i could easily explain why these different experimental scenarios would yield different incompatible outcomes so maybe there is no mystery there the problem then is only that we compare very different experimental scenarios in order to answer this objection, you would have to find a way to be much less disruptive, not to close a slit. And so there is one possibility of what you could do, which is to try to be much less disruptive. And that is to try to only observe the trajectories, only observe what happens without closing a slit. 
So what could this mean? This could mean that here you have your double slit set up again. You will now never close a slit or physically change anything. Uh, so the question that someone asks now, what are the outcomes when the detectors are exactly located at slit entrances is exactly what I'm now uh, trying to discuss. So again, you would have your, your wave function description is, is clear. We already discussed this and then you have the interference pattern. Um, but you have the suspicion still that behind it are these trajectories, maybe funny trajectories like this, who knows? I put a lot of question marks in here. And you would try to detect this and you could detect it uh, in many different ways. So you would, for example, have the possibility if this is an electron, you could scatter a photon here. You could have a microscope to observe the trajectory of the electron, or you could uh, place say an atom near the entrance of the slit. And if the electron passes by the atom, it will excite the atom. And later on, you can weed out uh, the excitation of the atom. So there are many different ways uh, to produce uh, such uh, detection. But anyway, we try to detect the trajectory or more modestly, at least we want to try to detect through which slit the electron has passed without otherwise influencing the physical situation. So that sounds much less disruptive. But before I go on, I want to answer the question that was just raised. What about when one closes or opens one slit What's the time scale in which the interference pattern appears or disappears? Well, actually, this is a good question that you could answer uh, using quantum mechanics. So the time scale, I would say, is simply the time it would need to trap for your wave to travel from the slit uh, down to the detector. Yeah? Because what will happen then is previously, you still had this uh, circular wave constantly emanating, say, from both the upper and the lower slit. Now, say, you close the upper slit, and then suddenly no new wave will be generated, but the wave that was already past the slit will still travel onwards to the screen. So the time scale is really the travel time for the typical velocity of your electrons uh, from the slit uh, to the screen, and then the interference pattern vanishes. OK, but back to this question. Let's just pretend we want to detect which uh, slit uh, our electron goes through. Now it turns out, even then the interference pattern vanishes. And that's quite exciting and interesting and we will uh, analyze it in much more detail when we uh, discuss measurements. But the original interpretation of this fact is due to Heisenberg because he was the first to analyze the situation. And therefore the situation is known under the name of Heisenberg microscope. So suppose you use light in order to detect your electron or atom or whatever it is, uh, your particle going through the slit. And what happens then is you realize that the scattering of a light quantum from the electron will influence your particle and it will influence it quite drastically so as to destroy the interference pattern. In quantum mechanical language, what happens is this. If you are able to carry out a measurement with sufficient space resolution so that you know which slit you have passed through, according to the rules that we just learned about collapse of the wave function or a slight extension of these rules, you should replace the wave, which was formerly very extended, you should replace it by something very localized in the vicinity of the slit, maybe something like this. So this is what happens after 
the measurement after you detect the presence of your electron wave function near the slit. And if this is true, then of course, afterwards, this wave will still go through the slit, but it is now only a single wave emanating from a single slit. And in the end on the screen, you don't see any interference pattern. And so one can also analyze this more quantitatively. One can say, aha, if I have a wave function of extent delta x, because it's localized now after the measurement on a scale delta x, which is comparable to the size of the slit, then um, if you have localized the particle down to this precision delta x, it means according to the Heisenberg uncertainty relation that immediately this wave function here, this localized wave function has a relatively large momentum spread. So uh, given some delta x localization uh, length, we immediately, according to the Heisenberg uncertainty relation, so delta x times delta p is larger or equal h bar half for any wave function, then we have delta p is larger than or equal h bar divided by two delta x. And as a consequence, if you then work out what happens to the wave function after the slits, it means that um, if delta x is indeed uh, less than the uh, slit distance, and it should be like that in order to unambiguously determine which slit you pass through, uh, then it's enough to destroy the interference. So later when we discuss measurement, we can go through this in more detail, but that's the essence of the Heisenberg microscope. And now this is just a fact, a fact about how uh, wave, waves work um, if you start to localize them in this manner. What are the lessons we can draw from this? Well, The first is more qualitatively that if you observe a quantum particle, you may strongly perturb its behavior. Now, I should say that if you think about it for a while, this is not unexpected even in classical dynamics, even if the world had forever remained a classical world, once you start considering microscopic particles that are very lightweight, very small, then they of course can be easily perturbed by relatively small forces. And if you want to observe them, there will always, even in a classical description, be some physical process behind it. For example, the scattering of light waves from the electromagnetic field and so it's not completely unexpected, even in classical physics, that you would perturb the particles. What is remarkable, though, is that in quantum physics, this perturbation is automatically to some degree stochastic. That's the first thing. And it's also very strong. In classical physics, again, if you think about uh, scattering electromagnetic radiation of a particle, you could solve the equations completely deterministically. You might indeed find that, say, the radiation pressure force will displace your particle a little bit and give it a kick. But you could work out all these details and then account for them. And so no problem would result in terms of your measurement accuracy. But in quantum mechanics, by necessity, the perturbation is stochastic. So for example, uh, in what we just discussed, this uh, scattering of the light quanta will be stochastic. And then at the same time, this perturbation in classical physics could be made very weak. 
just by using a very weak light field. And that would still be okay because you would just afterwards have to measure this very weak light field uh, very precisely in order to figure out exactly where the electron was located. But in quantum physics, this is not possible. Again, also because of the stochasticity, you have to reach a certain level, otherwise you don't get a good signal to noise ratio. But if you reach that level in order to get a good precision, then you also in introduce a strong perturbation and the perturbation is stochastic. So the consequence of this is that the perturbation in all the analysis you can do is always strong enough to completely destroy the trajectory. That is, it completely perturbs uh, the trajectory. Okay, so there were several questions now. Imagine there is a second double slit after the first measurement, you say. How far should the second double slit be to observe an interference pattern? So let me just start for a moment a new slide in order to try to answer this question. And you have to tell me whether I get your meaning correctly. Okay, so here I have my first double slit. I get these spherical waves. I get the interference pattern. And now suppose we have a definite event in a single run of the experiment. We get the electron localized here, right? So now you want to place a second double slit after the first measurement. If I understand you correctly, I should imagine that I have detected my electron. But now, of course, as we learned from the collapse of the wave function, only momentarily the wave function will be concentrated around this point, and then it will start to spread in all directions. Well, in principle, in all directions, so even to the left, but okay. And then in order to be able to observe interference again, I should make sure that I can cover both of these slits. So that is, okay, so thinking about it, I realize it's a little bit more complicated than that because the way I'm drawing it here, I'm drawing it as if there's still a characteristic wavelength, but that is of course not really true. What happens is after the detection, you have a strongly, strongly peaked wave function. As a consequence in momentum space, it is very widely extended. So it has all possible wavelengths, all possible momenta. And the way it then propagates after some time is actually a kind of textbook exercise to calculate this. Um, the it depends a little bit. Uh, so you don't start infinitely sharp, but uh, it's it's rather sharp, so to speak. Then you still have an envelope like this. And if I now draw the, say, only the real part of the wave function to keep it simpler, then what I will see is something like this. So, um, Okay, so what you see here is first a simple envelope, but you also see that the real part of the wave function has oscillations that become ever more rapid as I go out from the center. And there's a simple interpretation for this, namely the following. Um, if you say there are all possible kinds of momenta, then of course the larger momenta have the larger velocity, so they will propagate more quickly 
And as a consequence, they will travel a longer distance in a given time. So that means you get a kind of velocity filtering. The large velocities or large momenta, and therefore low wavelengths, they will be concentrated already far from the origin because they had this large velocity. And at the same time, the smaller velocities, the smaller momenta or larger wavelengths will be concentrated still near the, near the origin. So <laughs> what will happen to be very precise is actually, I do expect uh, if, if the wave that goes out here eventually covers both slits, I do expect an interference pattern, even on this second screen. However, the shape it looks like depends of course on the wavelength and the wavelength depends on time. So you should then make sure that you also record the exact time when you finally register an electron on the second screen. And if you register it relatively early, then it belongs to these fast moving particles that have a large momentum and low wavelength. So you should see an interference pattern probably with more fringes, so belonging to a low wavelength. And uh, conversely, if you register the uh, electron at a late time, that means it had belonged to the slow moving, low momentum particles, and uh, it would uh, be part of an interference pattern uh, that belongs to a longer wavelength. So you see, it's actually quite tricky. The question you asked and was a simple question to ask, but it's relatively tricky. Um, but now I maybe want to stop this discussion in order to move on. Um, yes, uh, just to answer questions quickly. Yes, there's also Fresnel versus Fraunhofer diffraction, which just means um, far field versus um, was this more detailed description? Okay. Let me then maybe continue here. Um, I want to say that we are still in the introductory part. So the point was here to go through what you would learn in the basic lessons of a quantum mechanics lecture, but go through these lessons with a slightly different angle to always al already bring up the questions that we will then try to answer in the rest of the lecture series. And there will be a whole chapter on measurements. And so we will come back to the things that we are discussing right now. Um, the main point I wanted to make here is that these observations, uh, things like the Heisenberg microscope Gedanken experiment and the realization that any attempt to observe the particles in more detail would lead to strong perturbations and completely destroy the interference pattern. These lessons that one took in the early days of quantum physics then gave rise to what is known as the Copenhagen interpretation. That's a loose, um, loosely defined phrase that uh, just summarizes the interpretation that Bohr and others like Heisenberg um, gave to what was understood in the early days of quantum physics. And one important piece is that there are no trajectories in quantum mechanics. So what we have been discussing uh, these past 40 minutes, um, the attempt to understand the probabilistic nature via individual trajectories that according to the Co Copenhagen interpretation should be abandoned. This attempt should be abandoned because it leads to contradictions and because these trajectories could not be observed anyway. And more than that, you should not even think of trajectories in quantum mechanics. So you should not imagine there are in principle these trajectories, but we just don't observe them. You should not even think of uh, trajectories in quantum mechanics because you're led into contradictions. And as a consequence, when you think of the measurement of say the particle position, it becomes real only when you do the measurement, when you register the electron at one place or another. Before that, you should not ascribe any reality to the position. 
that at least is the Copenhagen conclusion from all these observations. So the position or any observable becomes real only when the measurement is done. All of this sounds a little bit negative, but it was just the lesson that people drew from analyzing this and similar Gedanken experiments and realizing that whenever I try to argue in a way that I imagine there is a trajectory and there is a real position, even before I measure, then I easily run into contradictions. So that's the origin of this interpretation. Okay, so there are now still several questions. Could you say a bit more about stochastic? Oh, stochastic just means random. So the distinction I wanted to make is that if I describe a measurement process classically, then as I, as I told you, so let's use the slide also, then as I told you, even then, if I take my description serious, I would have to describe the physical process of say scattering electromagnetic waves from an atom or an electron if I want to observe it in a microscope and so on. But uh, these waves would be without any noise, completely deterministic, and I would therefore still get a perturbation, but all of this could be calculated. And if I can calculate it, I could then account for it. I could say, yes, of course, I know that this uh, wave interacting with my particle uh, exerted a force on my particle, for example, uh, in the case of light waves, this might be a radiation pressure force, but I know the strength of this force precisely. And so, yes, my particle starts moving to the right, but I can account for it. I know it. It's deterministic. I kind of calculated it. I can subtract it again afterwards. It's no problem. The problems arise only when there is some noise, yeah? when there is some unavoidable, you, on a, in a semi-classical picture, you could think of it as noise on your wave with which you want to measure, for example. And then you cannot predict what exactly will be the perturbation. And because you cannot predict what exactly will be the perturbation, you cannot correct for it. And that creates the real trouble. OK, good. So this was one question. I hope that answered a little bit the stochastic. Then uh, someone is. Um, eager to keep the trajectories. Can one think about rays and wave function wave fronts? Okay, that's interesting. So again, let me try to draw this. So here I have um, my wave propagating. Uh, these are, of course, the, the wave fronts, so the lines of constant phase. The wave is then moving in this direction. And I'm guessing the waves you are talking about would be somehow the waves, the, the, the rays perpendicular to the wave front, the kind of rays that you would talk about in geometric optics. And indeed, so first of all, I should remind everyone the way that Schrödinger arrived at the Schrödinger equation went this pathway. So he said, okay, suppose there is a wave equation we probably want that there should be a, something like a classical limit. So I should set up my wave equation such that Hamilton's equations of motion come out as the geometric optics of this wave equation. So he started from Hamilton theory. He wanted Hamilton theory, the classical deterministic motion of particles to describe motion along such trajectories as you would uh, expect it in geometrical optics. And then he asked, okay, but what should be the underlying wave equation? So this is the first remark. So it's tightly connected to how the Schrödinger equation was even derived in the first place. And the second remark is that later on, when we discuss the interpretations of quantum mechanics, we will actually see that there is one interpretation called the pilot wave theory that really says, oh yes, my particles, they are moving along these trajectories uh, perpendicular to the wave fronts. So stay tuned for the pilot wave theory. 
but this comes much later in the lecture series. So good question. Okay. So now uh, let me conclude a little bit this uh, chapter, still two things to say in the introductory chapter, and then we can move on to Bell inequalities. So the first thing I want to say is, it seems like a small addition, but it's still quite important. That's about many particle wave functions. We have now discussed the probability interpretation always in terms of a single particle being here or there. What about many particle wave functions? We already know how they should be treated. For formal reasons, you have a wave function that depends on all the positions simultaneously. And so the probability interpretation of this is that if you square this number and you multiply, say, by small volume elements, then this is, again, a probability, but which probability? Well, that's the probability to find all the particles when you measure them simultaneously to find all of them in this particular configuration given by the simultaneous specification of x1, x2, up to xn. So the probability to find one particular configuration So uh, if this is on a 1D line, you would have say X1 here, X2 here and X3 there, if there are only three particles. And the next time you check it, maybe they uh, will appear in different places. Now, this is not a big surprise. This is very similar to what you would have in classical statistical physics, where you would also have a joint probability density of all the different positions of all the particles and the probabilities you're talking about. There are also probabilities to find the many particle system in one configuration or another configuration. But since we're talking about a wave, having these waves that depend on many arguments is still a little funny Because, so first of all, these waves are now in a very high dimensional space, namely in configuration space, which is rather strange, right? So configuration space is the space of these configurations, each configuration being given by the simultaneous uh, determination of x1, x2, and so on. The second challenge is something that also looks a little bit odd is the following. Suppose I have now a wave function that in this configuration space is maybe uh, concentrated like this, but now I measure the position of particle number one and I find it to be here in some sm small interval, let's say. In this interval, I find particle number one. So if I apply the rules of quantum measurement, then I will just have to collapse my wave function to be compatible only with this observation which will mean that the new wave function is suddenly only the piece of the old wave function that was in this little interval. So only this, this piece down here. And why is this a little bit odd? Well, just by measuring x1, you have collapsed the whole many particle wave function. And for example, this large piece here which also involves different values of x2 is suddenly gone. And so the question is, is this a mystery or not? If you think about classical theory of statistics, actually it's not much of a mystery. If you have several correlated variables and you measure one, then you also get an update 
indirectly on the possible values of the other coordinates. So that doesn't seem mysterious, but we will see a little while later that indeed there are some situations where these wave functions, which we later identify with entangled wave functions, can lead to trouble in the interpretation of what you see. Okay, so there's a good question. So this many particle wave function, how could we visualize it? So um, yeah, it's a problem, of course. Um, we, are, we have done to talk about configuration space. I did not draw the wave fronts, but we could easily have wave fronts like this, but the interpretation would be different. Instead of saying, oh, I'm having a wave function that moves in two dimensions, it's a rather a wave function moving in configuration space. So if the wave more or less moves to the upper right, what this means is that the particle one has a momentum that is positive. And at the same time, particle two also has a momentum that is positive. So you always need to reinterpret things. And if you really have a many particle system, say with 100 particles, then of course no one can draw this high dimensional space anymore anyway. And so the only thing you could do is say, you plot the probability to find particle one at any point in space, which uh, you would do by taking the configuration space probability and integrating over all the other coordinates of all the other particles. So that would give you the probability only of particle one. And then you can see that moving around um, and that's all you can do basically. Okay. And so before leaving this chapter, I just want to remind everyone that all of these conceptual questions that we're about to discuss have somehow adopted a new urgency because of all the experimental progress that has been made in the past 18 years. Uh, Before I go there, which will only be a quick list anyway, there was a short question. Can we have a many particle wave function like f of, of psi of x1 comma p2? Yes, this is in principle possible. No one stops you from choosing a different basis for the different particles. So one could be described in a position basis, the other in a momentum basis and so on. So you can do this. There's another question. This multivariable approach looks a rather abstract idea. Well, this is a little bit what we already discussed last time. Um, if you start from Hamiltonian's equation, then the Hamilton function in classical mechanics is a simultaneous function of multiple variables, x1, x2, x3, p1, p2, p3. And if you start from there, you basically have no other choice. So this is how even in the very early days of quantum physics, even in 1925, they already had to assume that this is what should be done. There's another question. Will we be exploring conceptual questions of quantum theory within the path integral paradigm? No, I'm afraid not. Maybe if we get around to discussing, I don't know, Bohm effect and so on, then sometimes for technical reasons, path integrals are very helpful. But other than that, we will concentrate, well, first on discussing the, the concepts do not in principle depend on the detailed technical formulation. So for, for some good reasons, we often talk about the wave function but then again, there's the Heisenberg formulation and there's the path integral formulation. And many of the conceptual questions we will be discussing do not depend on the technical formulation. When we discuss decoherence or measurement or Bell's inequalities, these will be independent of the formalism. <laughs>
and that's important, of course. Okay, let me just quickly go on to do a little comparison. Let us write a little table where we compare the situation in 1925 with the situation today. And it's quite amazing what we can do today. So first about the atomic structure. One only had indirect evidence, for example, uh, spectral lines um, or the intensities of transitions. Today, we can actually see the orbitals of single atoms, for example, when they are lying on a surface. We can have situations where we know, oh, here's one atom, there's another atom, there's a third atom, and they're all sitting on a surface of many more atoms. There are pictures available showing this. And this is, for example, done by a scanning tunneling microscopy or atomic force microscopy. So we can see individual orbitals, individual wave functions of individual atoms. And then in the past, around 1925, all the information that was available in terms of spectroscopy, for example, came from weak excitation. So that means if I were to draw, say, as a function of time, the probability of finding any given uh, atom in an excited state, then if 100% is up here, uh, uh, it would always be very, very low. Today, the situation is extremely different. We can have the strong excitation of a single atom. So again, the same kind of plot. Now you can ramp up the laser drive. Lasers were not available in 1925. And if I plot the excitation probability as a function of of time, I can observe situations like this, which are called Rabi oscillations. So I can really go to a completely excited atom, which is precisely put in the excited state instead of having only a small probability of observing the excited state. And more than that, uh, we can also even observe individual quantum jumps. So we can by actual observation, see that a uh, quantum system for some time is in an excited state. For example, then it scatters more light and it is the light intensity that we are plotting. And then suddenly by say emission of a photon or so, it falls down to a lower excited level and then remains for a long time in this lower excited level. So these have been observed since the 1980s in individual quantum systems. And that's a good keyword. So um, when interference experiment were being done, these were always on large ensembles of particles. Yeah, so um, you would send many, many, many electrons through a double slit setup and then gradually uh, observe an interference pattern. And you, you would not do experiments on individual quantum systems. But today we do have access to individual quantum systems and we can control them. We can detect individual quanta. We can produce them. We can do interference experiments with them. We can control them. So all of this is nowadays possible. And a final distinction is that back in 1925, this was a description of nature, of natural systems only. 
Whereas nowadays, people can design and fabricate and coherently control artificial quantum systems. And this includes uh, many of these important physical systems like superconducting qubits, uh, iron trap qubits, uh, things like this, where, um, so maybe iron traps, I should not add to that because ions are natural, but anyway, superconducting qubits, semiconducting qubits that have been built uh, in order to potentially produce a quantum computer. Okay, so overall, the situation has much improved. Many of the Gedanken experiments of 1925 are now real experiments, and that makes the discussions about the foundations of quantum physics first more urgent, but also much more concrete and practical minded, because there is not any more the suspicion that if we did these foundational experiments, we would maybe observe something else, but we have confirmed quantum mechanics again and again even in these very challenging experiments on individual quantum systems, which get strongly excited, which display quantum jumps, everything that quantum theory predicts has been observed there. Okay. So are there still any questions at this point? Then I want to move on. We still have about quarter of an hour left and that I want to exploit in order to start at least the next chapter. And that's basically the most important chapter of the whole lecture series. And this is about Bell's inequalities. And since Bell's inequalities are strongly connected to the theory of entanglement. We will also talk a little bit about entanglement in quantum systems. Now, what is the starting point? The starting point is the question that was asked very early on already in the early days of quantum mechanics, is there some underlying microscopic theory that could help make sense out of quantum mechanics that could help explain quantum mechanics? That's the original question. It's a very natural question. And there are precursors of this. If you think about thermodynamics, thermodynamics was invented in the beginning of the 19th century when engineers started to ask about what is the most efficient engine that you can build. And people observed uh, heat uh, being produced when there is friction. And so this had to be included in the law of energy conservation. And then all these concepts were developed. So this is something to compare as an analogous uh, situation. So there was the theory of thermodynamics in the beginning of the 19th century. But then later it was realized, aha, these laws, they do not stand separately from the rest of physics, rather they ultimately derive from classical physics, classical dynamics, classical mechanics. And the theory that uh, is then built on top of classical mechanics and links it to thermodynamics is of course classical statistical physics. So Boltzmann distribution uh, and similar ideas. And so all the 
slightly magical concepts of thermodynamics like entropy, they can ultimately be explained via classical mechanics. And the hope in the beginning of quantum mechanics and for a long time, and maybe even now, is could there be something similar going on for quantum mechanics that helps us make sense of it, that we say quantum mechanics is like thermodynamics and effective theory, but there is something behind it. And when we understand what is behind it, maybe we can make more sense of it. Now, where do Bell's inequalities come in? They come in because they tell us that this hope at least suffers from very strong constraints. So a large class of possible, plausible, very reasonable sounding theories that could be the microscopic theory behind quantum mechanics are ruled out by experimental observations. And that is the content of Bell inequalities. And that's why it's so important that we discuss Bell inequalities at the beginnings of this lecture series, because otherwise we would always be wondering whether there is some potential, very simplified explanation for the strange effects that we are discussing. And oftentimes the answer would be no. So it's very important to learn about this right in the beginning. There are many ways to discuss Bell's inequalities and we will come at some point to the original derivation of Bell and all the slight variations that were then deduced. But it's extremely important to understand that Bell inequalities, though they have been, say, motivated by quantum theory, by the Schrödinger equation, by the predictions of the Schrödinger equation, they are ultimately completely independent of the formalism of quantum theory. They are a statement about nature, a statement that says that, as I said, a large class of possible plausible underlying theories must be abandoned. And in order to make this really clear, I want to start this chapter with a kind of Gedanken experiment that makes it clear just how mysterious and general Bell inequalities really are, that they are not related to any details of mathematical formalism. And so I gave this little subsection the name strange correlations. And the time today is just enough to set up the story. And then next time we will be able to discuss the consequences. And here I should give credit. So I'm following the version of the story invented by David Merman in a nice article in 1985. So the idea again is to bring out the crazy aspects of nature completely without reference to the formalism of quantum theory. So at this point, forget everything you know about the Schrödinger equation. And please don't have in the back of your mind, yes, I know quantum mechanics is mysterious. So whatever you tell me, I will never be surprised because I know that quantum mechanics is mysterious. This would be a bad attitude. So throw away the Schrödinger equation and just concentrate on the story that we are now going to discuss. Imagine that you are in an unknown laboratory building and you move into a lab, it's empty, except for three boxes, which you now inspect. So there's one box in the middle, and then there's one box on the left side, and there's another box on the right side. As you look a little bit more closely, you find certain aspects of these boxes. The box in the middle simply has a big button that one can press, and it seems to have openings. And sometimes when you press 
it, it seems a little bit as if something is rushing out of these openings towards either side, but you don't know any details. Anyway, there's a button that you can press. And then for both the box on the left-hand side and the box on the right-hand side, on closer inspection, you notice the following. There is two different light bulbs. One of them is red, the other is green. And this is true for both of these apparatuses. Okay. And then finally, you notice something else about these apparatuses. Namely, they have something like a knob. This knob can be turned to any one of three settings. For example, here it is currently set to setting number three. And the same happens on the other side. Okay. So this is all you see. Now we want to refer to these things. Sometimes I will call this A on the left side, and B on the right side. These are the two apparatuses that have these funny lights. And then the thing in the middle that seems like on pressing the button, it emits something we might call the source. So now you're an experimentalist you start pressing the button. And what you realize is that whenever you have pressed a button, exactly one light lights up at each of the two sides. So for example, here it might be the green light and here it might be the red light. And then you press the button again and then maybe it's the red light on the left and the green light on the right and so on and so on. And you start changing the setting of the knobs, so from three you go to two, from two you go to one, and so on. And you see these settings have something to do with the colors of the lights that are flashing. And you do this many, many times, and you observe exactly and very precisely the statistics, and you note down the statistics, and you make two observations that summarize everything. These two observations are very, very simple. The first one is whenever the settings are the same, so for example, on both sides, the knob is set to three, or on both sides, it is set to two. Whenever the settings are the same, it is always the same color that flashes. So for example, red, red, or green, green, always the same color, both on the left and on the right. So to abbreviate it, I will say same settings, same color. This is always true. Whatever you do, if you have the same settings, it's the same color that flashes. Maybe sometimes red, sometimes green, but it's the same color on the left and to the, on, to the right. And the second observation you make is the following. If you choose the settings completely randomly and independently, then also the colors seem to be completely random and independent. So if the settings are random, which to be very precise here means that you are setting set them such that the probability of having the setting combination one, one, so one to the left and one to the right is the same as the probability to have one, two and so on for all the other combinations, there are in total nine combinations. So if you choose the settings randomly and independently in this manner that all combinations are equally likely, 
uh, then the colors are uncorrelated. And random. So, uh, to be more precise, the probability to get red red is the same as the probability to, to get green green. It's the same as red green or green red. And this is all one quarter because there are four possibilities. So it's all one quarter. And the question we want to ask is. Should you worry? Should this bother you? Is there something strange here? Something to discuss? Or is it easily explainable? So that is the question we want to discuss next time. There are only these two very simple observations. Same settings, same color, settings random, colors also random. Should you worry? At first sight, it doesn't seem like something very mysterious, but we will analyze it. Okay, are there already questions here? That will be the last slide of this lecture today, but it's important that you understand the setting and that you understand these observations so you can already start thinking about them until next time. So are there questions here? It's a very simple setup. We don't appeal to quantum mechanics at all. We don't say, oh, we have spins or blah, blah, blah. We just observe some apparatuses. We see what happens when we press certain buttons and turn certain knobs and get outcomes that are encoded in these red or green lights flashing. And then we were very meticulous and did a very long experimental series and tried out many different settings. And we encapsulated the results in these two simple observations. And the question is now whether one should worry. Okay. Oops, now we got questions. In the case of random setting, when accidentally the knobs are at the same position, do the colors always coincide too? Yes, of course, yes, yes. So um, I'm choosing the settings completely randomly. Sometime it will happen that they are just randomly the same. So one, one, for example, happens in uh, one out of nine cases. And then according to the first observation, uh, yes, the colors will be the same. But there's no contradiction because in the second observation, I'm just lumping together all the results. So I just say over all, on average, over all these random settings, which includes both the settings being the same and being different, then also the fraction of cases in which the colors are the same is only 25%. And the, uh, sorry, the fraction of cases in which the colors are the same is 50%. 25% for RR and 25% for GG. And the fraction where they are different is also 50%. So that's all compatible. So that also should answer the second question. When, random, when we randomly have the setting 1, 1, which means the settings are the same on the left and the right, no, we could not get RG because that would contradict the first observation. So both of these observations are true all the time. Very good questions. You are um, trying to go into the right direction. Um, in number two, if we were to write down a table of probabilities, which is one of the things we're starting to do next time, then, of course, uh, this table will also be constrained by the observation number one. So if the two knobs are in the same setting, for example, 1, 1 or 2, 2, just to make it clear, again, we will always have the same color. 
but it could be red, red, or it could be green, green. It just needs to be the same on the left and the right, but it's uh, in different runs, it could be red, red, or green, green. The first assumption does not exclude that we get the same color when the settings are different. When the settings are different, basically we have complete freedom, at least at first sight. Uh, they could be the same, sometimes they will be the same, sometimes they will be different. So number one doesn't say anything about what happens if the settings are different. Someone said RR and GG should be more likely to happen overall. Probably you say this because of one, because there's a tendency towards the same color. But remember, there's also many different setting combinations where the two settings are not the same. And so this could help us to reduce the overall fraction of the RR and GG, depending on what is the statistics when we don't have the same setting. So there's a lot of freedom. This is the one point that we will discuss next time. There's, even though these two observations are given, there's still a lot of freedom in choosing the probabilities. So at first sight, uh, we have a lot of freedom. If you do the experiment two times with the same configuration, well, I could still get different colors, but it still always needs to be the same color on the left and the right. Good, good, good. So as a homework, in a sense, you should all think about these observations. There's still a question, should be the same color half the time from random standard, but only one third of the time from same setting standard point. Um, I don't quite understand the question. Maybe I first answer this second question. Is it relevant that the number of knobs is three and the lights is two? Well, um, for the lights, two is kind of the minimum because if I ha have only one light, then it's boring. That is always the same light that flashes, I guess. So two is the minimum to make something interesting. It turns out also from the number of knobs, if I did not have three, possible settings, but two, then, then I would arrive at a different Gedanken experiments. Uh, then I could still make something interesting, but then the observations would get more complicated and then uh, it's not so much fun anymore. So this is kind of the simplest version that gives interesting results. Any extensions to larger number of settings and larger, larger number of colors, of course, that could easily be done. Okay, so I suggest you play around a little bit. It's really a fun little game. Try to figure out whether you can come up with possible explanations. And I tell you, there are simple explanations at first sight, but then I will introduce another aspect that there is no communication between these apparatuses and then it gets really tricky and really mysterious. Well, the homework is just to think about the statistics, try to understand exactly what's maybe going on, make your own little tables of probability, see whether you can make sense of it. Okay, so then uh, see you next time. Have a good week and see you next time so that we can try to understand this mystery. Oh, there was a final question, are the two wave packets correlated? Well, this is just, don't think in terms of wave packets even or correlated and so on. Um, presumably, yes, there are some correlations, obviously, because of the first observation, we know this already. Um, but refrain from thinking it, of it in terms of quantum mechanics. There's two things that are somehow emitted by the source to the left and to the right. And yes, maybe they are correlated. Maybe they even need to be correlated in order to explain these funny observations. Okay, see you next time. <laughs>